Hey, what's up, guys? This is Janai Jackson, and welcome back to the Wisdom Series. We are in Chapter 2 of the Book of James. We covered the first part of this chapter in our last episode, so if you haven't had a chance to watch that episode yet, please go back and give it a listen. In our last episode, we covered the sin of partiality. We went through James's response, or rather, his rebuke to the Messianic Jews in great detail. In that second part, James is continuing his rebuke to the Messianic Jews, teaching them the relationship between faith and works. Now, this lesson is a crucial one for us to understand because historically there has been a lot of confusion surrounding this relationship and how it pertains to our salvation. The Messianic Jews did not truly understand this relationship either, hence why James had to break it down for them. The second part is broken up into two sections. The first is the interrogation and the second is James's response to the challenges brought up in this discussion. The first section covers verse 14 through 17. It reads, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James starts this section with two questions. The first is this, what good is it if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And the second, which is a follow-up to the first, is can that faith save him? These are two important questions to consider when discussing the relationship between faith and works. It is unfortunate how many Christians, and yes, I'm including myself in this, have taken the Old Testament with all of its laws and disregarded it while they apparently bask in the grace and mercy found in the New Testament. We have a tendency to believe that because we have faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer bound to obey the laws found in the Old Testament. And that's a shame. Many of us hold to the doctrine of the Trinity, yet our actions say differently. Deep down, some of us actually believe that the God of the Old Testament, who handed Moses the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Torah, is different than Jesus and the work of the cross. We separate the two as if they are not one. If we truly understood the Trinity, and if we truly believe that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons within the same Godhead, we would not be acting as if there is a difference between the words of Christ and the words of God. Jesus spoke on the relationship between the faith and works in John 14, 15 through 17. It reads, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. How do you know if you love God? Ask yourself, do you keep his commandments? If you don't keep his commandments, then you do not love him. Now, I know many of you are already screaming to the top of your lungs saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought we weren't saved by works, and that's true. We aren't. However, Jesus is not teaching us how to be saved in this passage. He is teaching us how to determine if we are saved. There's this difference. You claim to be a teacher all day long, but if you do not do the work of a teacher, then your profession is useless. Same goes with our salvation. When we profess Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, that is a great and amazing thing. But that profession starts to lose its significance if the work of Christ isn't manifesting in our day-to-day -day life. Obedience is the one test of sincerity. As a child, you know who your parents are and you obey them. The same goes with God. If you are his child, then you will obey him. Now, our obedience will not be always perfect, hence why Jesus promises the helper. That is the Holy Spirit. In verses 16 and 17, without the helper, we are hopeless. But with him, we can have hope that we will finish the race. So with that understanding, we can then return back to James's message and understand what he is getting at. In verses 15 and 16, he gives his own example of how it is useless to say to a brother, be filled and warm when we haven't given him any food or proper clothing. The same way this gesture is useless is the same way our profession of faith is useless if it is not justified by our works. This leads us to the famous saying, faith without works is dead. This is James' concluding point to the Messianic Jews. This message is parallel to his lecture to them about not just being hearers of the word, but doers as well. 
James is not impressed by how much they can recite the Torah if that knowledge is not manifesting to obedience. What good is it to proclaim the message of God if you neglect the orphans and the widows and show favoritism to the poor? Your religion is useless unless you understand that obeying the words of Christ is a lifestyle, not a hobby. Even though James makes this point abundantly clear, he follows it up by answering some common rejections to his teaching. We can read them in verses 18 through 26. It reads, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. I will give you the full outline of these verses so that we can understand them in totality and properly. These are two parts to the section. The first is the opposer's challenge found in verses 18a, and the second is James's response to that challenge found in verses 18b through 26. James's responses can also be broken down into three distinct parts that all work together to further his argument against the opposer. The first response is in regards to the faith and works. The second is to creedal faith, and the third is to biblical proof. Working with this outline, we can now track James's train of thought better when he gives his response to this common rebuttal. Speaking of that common rebuttal, let's reread that, shall we, so that we can track the nature of this conversation in real time. Verse 18a reads, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Now, before we move into the meat and potatoes of this statement, let's first determine who this someone is. James doesn't explicitly say it in the text. However, we may have one clue about who this someone is. Now, roll with me here. Who is James writing to? He is writing to the Messianic Jews of the 12 tribes of the dispersion, as mentioned in our first lecture on James. For the Jews, they held to the te teaching of the Torah. For some, it was not so much as a matter of will we have faith in God, but rather will we hold to his commandments. To be clear, holding to the law of God is good. We literally just discussed that earlier in this lecture. However, holding to God's commandments without the right intent is futile because at the end of the day, you still don't hold to the whole law. That is what the Israelites of the Old Testament and the Pharisees of the New Testament did not understand. If you hold to the letter of the law, but not the heart of the law, you are still guilty of the law itself. And even if you hold to both, you still have violated even one of the commandments in your lifetime. So you are guilty of it all, as we learn in our last lecture in studying chapter 2 of James. This brings us to the meat and potatoes of the oppressor's statement. This person, who is more likely a Jew, is equating faith with works by saying, You have faith, and I have works. He sees no point of distinction. What James' opponent is getting at is that one can be saved through faith, and another through his works. Both are equally valid forms of keeping the covenant. And it's this point that prompts James's responses. We will analyze them point by point. This first response is found in verse 18b, and it reads, Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Immediately, we see that James is having none of his opponent's nonsense. For James, this person has clearly misunderstood the relationship between faith and works. James corrects this misunderstanding with his rhetorical response. As James has already made it clear, it makes no sense for someone to say that they have faith in Jesus and yet their works doesn't reflect it. Likewise, you can never do enough to supplement your need to have faith in Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 64, 6, it reads, We have all become like the one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. 
Now let's notice the strong language of Isaiah. He says, all of our righteousness are like polluted garment. Imagine trying to go to God and trade in our filthy clothing, that being our works, in exchange for eternal salvation. That proposal is a joke to God and is unacceptable. Remember, our righteousness alone is filthy because all of us have already violated one of, if not all of, God's law, and so we are guilty of all of it. Martin Luther says it like this, The most damnable and pernicious heresy that has ever plagued the mind of man is that somehow he can make himself good enough to deserve to live forever within all holy God. Returning back to James's first response, we can now understand why he rejects his opponent's presupposition. To think that one can solely be saved by works is foolish. However, what's also equally foolish is the idea that we can be saved by just having a profession of faith. Although having faith is a good start, James fixed this by adding, I will show you my faith by my works. You see, it is by our good works that we are able to justify our claim to saving faith. To say that we have faith, but we don't obey the commandments of, one, of the one whom we have faith in is ludicrous. With that in mind, we can now move on to his second response found in verses 19, and it reads, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. James turns up his intensity in this response. He gives his opponent credit for believing that God is one. It is good to know that all hope may not be lost. James then adds this comment, you do well. If we can translate this comment to our modern day conversational speech, that comment translates to a sarcastic, good for you, or congratulations, signifying that you get no credit for believing the basic belief that there is a God and that he is one in essence. He goes even further in his sarcasm by stating that even the demons believe and shudder. The fact that the demons hold to the same belief as the Messianic Jews is proof that the Jews claim that only a creedal faith can save you is false. But James does not stop here. He says that at least the demons shudder. Now, why add that point? The fact that the demons believe was enough to solidify his point, and yet he adds that they shudder as well. James adds this point to show that a true belief in God is one that would prompt some type of response. For the demons, their response is to shudder in fear. However, for the Jews, their response is nothing. If the Messianic Jews truly believed their creedal faith, it would come out in their actions one way or another. Now, even though James's point is perfectly clear at this point, he adds another response. This third response has four elements to it. The outline of this response is as follows. The first is the questions about proof. The second is the proof found in Abraham. The third is the proof found in Rahab. And the fourth is the conclusion. We will start with the first, which is found in verses 20. It reads, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? The intensity is all the way up on this rhetorical question. James calls this person foolish, which is the ultimate sign of judgment that you can pronounce on a person. In the Bible, a fool is someone who says in his heart, there is no God. Now, the interesting thing here is that the hypothetical Messianic Jew did not verbally say that there is no God, but his lack of response to his supposed faith declares that there is no God. If there was a God, he would be prompted to act. James wants to hammer home this point of contention, so he then moves into showing how Abraham and Rahab were perfect examples of how their faith in God prompted them to act. We first start with the Abraham example, which is found in verses 21 through 24. It reads, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteous. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Here's where we come to a historical point of contention in the church. Now, this passage of scripture has confuddled the body of Christ for centuries. And although my aim is not to get into the historical background of the interpretation of this passage, it still must be addressed, this passage nevertheless. At first glance, it seems that James is disagreeing with Paul in verse 21 when he says that Abraham was justified by his works. In Romans 4 and 2, for those who don't already know, Paul states this. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, here's what's interesting. Both James and Paul use the same word, justified, and they use the same example, that being Abraham. This makes understanding this passage much more difficult to explain from first glance. However, with diligent study, we can begin to see what's really going on here. First, I believe that it's important to point out that there are two different definitions of the word justified. The first is to show or prove to be right or reasonable, and the second is to be declared or made righteous in the sight of God. Here's a sentence that would coincide with the first definition. The fact that Michael Jordan won six championships justified his claim to be considered as the GOAT. Here, Michael Jordan's claim that he is the greatest of all time is empty up until he shows his six rings. Here's a sentence that would coincide with the second definition. We are justified before God by our faith in him. Here, it is clear that we are reconciled to God and made righteous by our faith in him. Returning back to the passage in view with both definitions in mind, we see that the definition that James has in mind is not the second, but rather the first. First, we know that James is trying to prove to the Messianic Jews that it's not good enough to say that you have professing faith in God if your life doesn't line up with your profession. In verse 22, he says that Abraham's faith was active along with his works. In other words, his faith was not dead. It was not inactive. So there is no justification. There is no proof that you have faith if you do not have works following your profession. It's not good enough to call yourself a Christian. Your works must justify your claim. It must be proof of your salvation. We know that this interpretation is correct because both James and Paul have the same understanding in regards to works as it relates to salvation, being that it does not save you. Remember what James said in verses 8 through 11. He said this, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whosoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. No one can keep the whole law perfectly every single day. Only Christ has reached the goal of total perfection, and James understands this. He knows that it is our faith in Jesus Christ that saves us. But his point is this, what good is that faith if you aren't transformed by it? Paul explains the purpose of the law and its relationship to our salvation in Galatians chapter 3. I will not read the whole chapter here simply because it will be too long to read, but it is definitely worth giving it a good read when you have the chance. It is our faith that brings us into action. We see how James hammers home the point when he reuses Rahab as an example in verses 25. It reads, And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Rahab's hospitality was her act in faith in Yahweh. In Hebrews, the author uses Rahab as an example of faith and hospitality in chapter 11 and verse 31. So, we see how James is focusing how her faith was validated and therefore made righteous before God upon her actions. Again, this doesn't describe a works-based salvation, but rather this shows you how faith and works are inseparable. Yes, we are saved by faith alone, but you have faith in Jesus and, you, and if you truly love him, you would obey his commandments. In Revelation 20, 11 to 12, it reads, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. The Bible is clear on that it is by our faith that we are saved, but it is by our works that we will be judged. You can talk all that talk all day long, but if your life doesn't back up what you profess, then you will be damned to the lake of fire. This brings us to the last element to this four-part response by James. Verse 26 reads, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now, this is an interesting analogy. James equates the relationship between the body and the spirit with faith and works. 
When our spirit leaves us one day, it will leave behind the body, and the body will be nothing more than a smelly, decomposing corpse. The same goes with our faith. If the works of the spirit or the fruits of the spirit is not evident in our life, our claim to faith is nothing but a smelly, decomposing corpse. It's dead. One last thing to point out about this. Who wrote about the fruits of the spirit? Paul did. Again, this is proof that Paul and James did not have two different views of how we should receive salvation, but rather they are speaking from two different perspectives. Now, anyways, guys, that's the video. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to support this channel by leaving a like or a comment or even subscribing to this channel as it does help a lot. Chapter three of James is coming up soon. Stay tuned for that. But until next time, guys, peace.